Thank you everyone for uh, attending this uh, seminar by Prof. Marcus Bruckner. Um, Marcus Bruckner is a um, professor of macroeconomics at the Research School of Economics at Australian National University. Uh, he is um, an Australian Research Council Fellow. At RSE, he heads the economics program of the Institute for Advanced Studies. Marcus, Marcus' research interests are in the field of macroeconomics, international economics, and political economy. He has published in a wide uh, variety of journals, uh, in leading field journals, and uh, his research has been featured in Bloomberg, Financial Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Economist. Uh, he has also been engaged in numerous uh, consulting projects for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, he is engaged with the Commonwealth Departments, including as a macroeconomic advisor at the Australian Treasury, which is like the finance, uh, Ministry of Finance here. Uh, as a member of the team put together by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, he has given lectures at the Macroeconomic Management of Natural Resources at the Africa Training Institute. So with that, I welcome Marcus to make a presentation on the topic of inequality and economic growth. Thank you. So, and, uh, sorry, uh, before you start, I would like to uh, present this one presentation uh, on behalf of the Indian Institute of Management. Thank you. Uh, say thank you uh, for having this opportunity to be here uh, at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. The talk is on a topic that has a tr tradition in macroeconomics and development economics. And I want to cover today three papers. First one is already published in the Journal of Economic Growth, where together with Era uh, at the IMF and Mark, who's at Ben Gurion University, we estimate the effect that GDP per capita as a measure of average income has on income inequality. And the second paper will build on that first paper for reasons that will become apparent throughout the talk and flip the question around and ask how does the distribution of income in an economy affect? GDP per capita. Yeah. Now, it will turn out to be the case that the effect of income inequality on GDP per capita or transitional GDP per capita growth, yeah, so growth in the short run but not in the long run, uh, depends on the initial income uh, of an economy. And then we're going to take these estimates here and apply them to uh, ASEAN economies. Why ASEAN economies? Well, uh, the simple answer is that there was a conference uh, organized by the Lee Kuan Yew Public Policy School in Ho Chi Minh City in 2017. And, uh, so this question here, the rise of the middle class and economic growth of, in ASEAN was of interest, but at a deeper level, uh, the reason why we uh, wrote a kind of a follow-up paper uh, the focus on ASEAN economies is that these economies have had a lot of growth over the past three or four decades. Uh, we can, of course, also apply our estimates to India, where there's been tremendous growth over the past uh, decades. So let me start off by saying that every good empirical paper uh, has a theory uh, that it's motivated by. Uh, our paper is uh, motivated by theories where there are imperfections in the financial markets. Uh, in the data we observe uh, that there is a difference between the deposit rate, uh, the interest deposit rate, and the uh, borrowing interest rate. And uh, I'm going to talk in the next slides about uh, two important papers where in the presence of such financial market imperfections, income inequality affects economic growth transitional growth, that is, but also growth in average income affects inequality. So there's a two-way causality. Uh, the theories of financial market, where there are financial market imperfections, they say that the effect of income inequality on transitional growth varies depending on the stage of development. There are two th other th main theories out there. One is political economy type of theories, where the distribution of income in a democracy affects uh, taxation. So where inequality is high, the median voter is more inclined to vote for higher income taxation. 
and uh, to the extent that that disto distorts uh, labor allocation, yeah, uh, this will uh, have an effect on GDP per capita and possibly uh, GDP per capita growth. So these political economy theories, they postulate that inequality has a negative effect on growth, while as this first theory here, uh, based on financial market imperfection, says it depends. Now the uh, third group, namely the conflict group, where the hypothesis is that in economies where income is unequally distributed, uh, this gives rise to conflict, yeah, wars, in other words, over resources. Uh, we're not going to delve into the second and third one. We're going to uh, be motivated by the first one, the first type of theory, the financial market imperfections. Yeah? So uh, I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so uh, giving you a very simple summary of what that theory is about. Uh, I'm not going to show you any kind of equations, not, nothing complicated, but I'm going to give you some examples, some numerical examples. Uh, the two main papers uh, out there in the literature were the uh, Abanaji and Newman, the uh, 93 paper about occupational choice, and the Gallo and Zera paper, uh, both occurred around the same time. And the example that I want to, uh, the examples that I want to give you, uh, you can think of them you can think of this with investment in human capital. Uh, of course, what's the difference between investment in human capital and, uh, let's say, when one starts up a firm, a business? Well, when one invests in human capital, at the time, there's no collateral, right? Well, as if one starts up a firm, a company, there's typically some collateral, some physical asset there. Uh, so financing constraints uh, with regard to human capital are much more severe. Uh, because of no collateral at the time of the accumulation than uh, for physical capital. Uh, now, the key idea is that this investment in human capital, it's useful. Now, that has to be a key assumption. So there is a return uh, in the future. So resources are used today to accumulate human capital, and then there's a return in the future. Yeah. But there's a financing issue with regard to that human capital. And... Uh, in the presence of financing constraints, yeah, and the source of the financing constraint is moral hazard, yeah, uh, you have to be sufficiently rich in order to finance the human capital. Yeah. So um, the next slides will give some examples for that, but what comes out in, in, in these models is that with moral hazard in credit markets, with moral hazard in credit markets, uh, the distribution of income affects investment and in such a way that in poor countries, so where average income is low, inequality has a positive effect on investment yeah, because the, the key assumption is that there are fixed costs to investment. And if the, if the cost, if the fixed cost to investment does not vary with the level of development, so as average incomes rise, uh, then inequality becomes a bad thing for investment yeah? because uh, it will prevent some of the relatively poor from investing in a rich economy. Yeah? So the next, the next slides will, will give uh, an example of that. Uh, first, let me talk about how average income affects the distribution of income and then talk about how the distribution of income affects average income. Yeah? So again, the key assumptions are that there are fixed costs to investment all right, and some kind of co-financing of the investment is needed yeah, because of risk of default. There's moral hazard. Okay? So, as average incomes rise in the economy, yeah, so you can think of this some kind of threshold, some kind of fixed cost threshold, and there are, say, two groups. When average incomes rise, that means that the incomes of both groups rise in the same way. So the rich, they were able to invest anyway. But as average incomes rise, eventually the poor will be able to come across the threshold. And when the poor invest, they accumulate human capital, 
that human capital has a return to it and therefore the income gap closes. Yeah, that is why a rise on average income through the human capital accumulation channel will lead to a reduction in inequality because as average incomes rise more and more people will be able to pay the fixed cost to investment. Investment has a return to it and therefore the income gap closes. Yeah. So, here is an example. Um, yeah, so, suppose the cost of investment is twenty dollars and case one here is a, is a poor economy where average income is six dollars. Yeah. And so, you have initially two groups uh, one with, with one dollar yeah, fifty percent of the population is one dollar and then the other half they got eleven dollars. Well, both groups need, need some kind of loan yeah, they both need a loan. Uh, if there is a, a risk of default, co-financing is needed yeah? because of moral hazard reasons. Yeah? Okay? Is, 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 that, is, that, is that clear from a basic financing point of view that if one knocks at the door of the bank and the bank has to give out let us say uh, almost twenty dollars as a loan, uh, there is a high risk that there is some of bad quality that will ask for the loan and therefore uh, there is a there's a there's a high risk of, of default and the bank will, is unlikely to give out the loan. Yeah. On the other hand, if there's some kind of co-financing, let's say 50 percent uh, is co-financed by the low app loan applicant, then the ones which are of low quality, they're unlikely to uh, ask for a loan because they know that uh, they're not going to be successful. Okay, and therefore uh, the bank is much more likely to give out a loan here to group two where that can co-finance let's say 50 percent of the investment cost, uh, but group one is very unlikely to get a loan, very unlikely. Now, so in this kind of, in, in this case one, uh, group one will get the loan invest, okay, and there is inequality there uh, because the group one, sorry, the group two, they get a return from the investment and therefore the income gap widens. But now as average incomes rise, so if one goes from case one to case two, yeah, some average income in the economy goes up by a factor of ten, yeah, so from six dollars to sixty dollars. And initial inequality is such that the group one gets ten times more, the group two gets ten times more, so that's I'm, I'm just bumping it up, everything by a factor of ten. Yeah, so average incomes rise by a factor of ten. But note that going from here to there, this group two, they, they still invest, so nothing has changed there. Yeah. But now, group one can co-finance about half of the investment project and is therefore quite likely to get a loan as well. Now, what happens in this case is that group one can now invest. This group two here was able to invest anyway. Right. And as group one invests, they get a return in the future and that makes the income Gap narrow. Okay. Do you have a? You, have, you already have a question? No. No. Okay. So that's so that's that's why with the fixed cost of investment, and this is crucial. Yeah. So the fixed cost of investment does not vary as one goes from case one to case two, from the poor economy to the rich economy. Inequality goes down. So, so this is all investment in human capital. Right? Yes. Yeah. Investment in human capital. Yeah, and you can think of the fixed cost of investment as some kind of surplus being needed in order to study. But it, uh, yes. So here, your kind of multiplying the history to hold this solution by a constant factor. Yeah. And is the bigger concern is about the poor part sort of getting stuck on their those one dollar, where the richer part can get more than proportional. So the average increases, but the spread also. Yeah, yeah, this is just an example to, yeah. to show that when average incomes rise, uh, that this that this will narrow income inequality. Now I'm going to flip it around and say what happens if one fiddles around with inequality, how that affects average income. Uh, okay, and, and hopefully, hopefully that will that will uh, answer your question. So these. These theories uh, or these papers, whether financial market imperfections, uh, what comes out of them is that when one thinks about how income distribution affects 
average income in the economy, one has to distinguish between poor economies and rich economies. And by poor economies, I simply mean with regard to average income, you know, that average income is low. And it turns out that in poor countries, some inequality will be necessary for human capital accumulation. Why is that the case? Because it allows at least some to pay for the fixed cost of investment. In rich economies where average income is high, it's the opposite. Yeah? So when, when inequality widens, in other words, at the bottom end some people are made poorer, they will be prevented from paying the fixed cost of investment. And remember the key assumption is that this investment in human capital has a high return to it and it raises aggregate productivity yeah, so that in the future there is growth. So let me give you uh, examples. Again, there's a fixed cost of investment of $20. And uh, consider now the poor country case. Yeah. Country is poor. In case one, it's egalitarian. Everybody has $2. Yeah, so 100% have $2. Now in that case, if everybody has $2 and the fixed cost of investment is $20, the bank would have to finance almost entirely the total cost of investment. And then there's a high risk of default, so that's not going to happen. So it's unlikely that they'll be able to invest in this kind of economy. Now consider case two. Average income is still $2. Okay, so from case one to case two, I'm keeping average income the same, but I'm now creating some inequalities. So that's why I said the country is still poor in the sense that with regard to average income. Yeah. But I'm creating inequality yeah, in such a way that 90% have one dollar, so they just have enough to eat, yeah, to get by, and 10% uh, they got eleven dollars. Now, they can co-finance about half of the investment cost. Yeah? And so it's quite likely that they get a loan. So now suddenly, investment can take place. Right? In this case, there's, there's, almost, there's, there's no investments. But now in case two, where there's some inequality, investment can take place. Yeah? So that's, that's the basic idea that when average income is low, one can, by redistributing in such a way that there is a sufficiently rich upper class that will be allowed to invest. And that investment then raises average income, but of course inequality widens dynamically. Dynamically. Yeah? Dynamically. Now go to the rich country, yeah, where average income is $20. Case one is, is that it's egalitarian. Yeah. Everybody has $20. Well, in that case, everybody is going to be able to invest. Yeah. But again, take a rich country where average income is $20, but it's unequal. And this is just an example. So let's say 20% have $80 and 80% have $5. Yeah. So there's inequality there in the rich country. Well, this group, they can certainly invest, but now suddenly group one that just has $5, they need to take out three quarters of a loan. So there's a significant chance that the bank will not give out a loan to them because there's not enough co-financing there. All right? So suddenly, applicants from group one may not be able to invest. Yeah? And uh, in that case, average productivity will go down yeah? in this case. So that's why... When thinking about how inequality affects growth, transitional growth that is, yeah. uh, one has to distinguish between rich countries and poor countries. Yeah? And, and that's what comes out of the theory. I just gave some very simple examples to, to illustrate that point. Yeah? And we're going we're gonna to take that, uh, that theory serious uh, when we estimate the effect that inequality has on growth. Uh, and also when estimating the effect that, uh, that uh, GDP per capita has on inequality. Okay, so uh, just to make it clear, we're interested in, uh, in two equations. One where, okay, so I can, I can basically write up to, 
Oh, I can I can use the marker. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so um, okay, so there are two equations. It's a simultaneous system of of equations. Very simple. Okay, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. So where uh, the first equation is how inequality yeah is affected by GDP per capita. And the second equation is how GDP per capita is affected by inequality. Yeah. Now, as suggested by the theory, the effect here depends on initial GDP per capita, yeah? But that's, that's a conceptual, that's going to be, when we estimate it, it's going to be a conceptual issue then with regard to the literature. Now, of course, econometrically, econometrically, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's an identification issue here, yeah? So, we're going to use instrumental variables estimation, uh, well, it's going to become clear. It's going to be it's going to be transitional growth. So it's going to be basically an AR1 specification for the levels with an AR1 coefficient below unity. Okay. Uh, but but here I just want to keep with the notation as simple as possible. So what we do is in the first paper we have instruments for GDP per capita. All right, and that allows us to get an estimate alpha hat, yeah, an IV estimate, okay? So we have, we're going to have instruments here for GDP per capita. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get from the first paper, which I'm going to discuss now, a U hat. So basically variation in inequality that is not due to within country variation in GDP per capita, okay? And uh, what we're going to do then, we're going to use that as an instrument here in the second equation to get variation and inequality that is not due to GDP per capita, yeah? So this goes back to the, to the 80s, uh, to people like Hansen, uh, where in Econometrica it was discussed how to identify uh, simultaneous systems of equations. Yeah? So, well, of course, the assumption here yeah, is when we do an IV estimate here of beta, yeah, which is basically just the covariance between u hat and GDP PC over the covariance between u hat and inequality that here we have to impose a zero covariance restriction between the error terms. Yeah? This, this, this is what we're going to do yeah, in the second paper. So as I said in the beginning, uh, we're going to use the results from the first paper, which I'm going to discuss now, where we want to see by how much, or if at all, uh, GDP per capita, so average income affects measures of inequality. And then from this first paper, we will use the residual here in inequality that's not due to GDP per capita as an instrument yeah, to estimate the effect that measures of inequality have on GDP per capita. Of course, uh, we have the assumption, or what, what, we need, what we need for that for consistent estimation is uh, that the error terms here are, are uncorrelated. Yeah? So this is essentially a problem of omitted variables. Okay, so this IV strategy here uh, gets rid of reverse causality bias, but it's not well suited to deal with omitted variables. Okay, so this is just the econometric framework that, uh, that we're going to use. So there's even reverse causality in the first equation as well, right? Well, yes, and as, as in fact suggested by the theory. Right. The question, how large is it? Well, that's going to depend on alpha. And I'm going to show you some results for that. Yeah. So 
with an IV estimate of alpha in hand, one can then use the residual to instrument for inequality in the second equation. Okay? To deal, to, to get rid of the reverse causality bias. It's not going to address omitted variables. That's, that's, uh, that, that's, that's not what uh, can be done. Yeah? So that's the econometric framework. Um, now let me discuss the results so from the first paper. So in the first paper, we have two instruments for GDP per capita. The first is a trade weighted GDP per capita. Uh, no, it's just trade weighted GDP, which comes from Achimoglu, Johnson, Robinson, uh, AR paper uh, with Pierre Girard. Uh, so Achimoglu, Johnson, Robinson, and Girard in, in 2008 in the AR. So the idea is that um, when the GDP of trading partners goes up, uh, there is more demand for the products that, uh, that the home country sells, and therefore uh, GDP of the home country should go up as well, and it should go up more uh, in countries that disproportionately trade more in, in the trading partners as their GDP goes up uh, relative to countries that uh, don't trade as much with uh, those other countries. So it's a trade-weighted GDP, uh, and that's the first instrument. And the second instrument is the interaction between the international oil price and the net export shares of oil and GDP. Yeah. Just so you want to add part in there. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the you know, that's really good. Then, you know, my trading partner's GDP going up eventually cost by my GDP to work. Right. So you're predicting it as an exogenous which I'm just asking right, how would exogenous Yeah, so that, right, so that, right, no, no, I, I understand. So that's, uh, that works for small countries, for small countries, right? We, we will do some, uh, some exercises where we take large economies out, where we take the large economies out. Uh, and that, that also uh, is, is a concern here with the second instrument, which is basically a terms of trade shock, yeah? So the interaction between the international oil price and the net export shares of oil and GDP. Yeah? So the idea is, but it goes a bit deeper, uh, take an exporting country versus an importing country when the international oil price rises, that's a positive income shock for the exporting country, but a negative shock for the importing country. Within the exporting country, the positive shock is, is larger, the higher is the uh, export share in GDP. And for the importing country, the negative shock with regard to average income is larger, the higher is the import share in GDP. Yeah. It's, the export of oil? it's a net export. So because this is a panel of countries, we have some importers, some exporters, and to get additional variation, it's net exports over GDP. So overall net exports. Yeah, so the difference between exports and so imports. So if oil prices going up, that's good? I mean, that's good for the exporters and bad for the importers, and it's even, and, and, and quantitatively, it's, <laughs> It's more good, the larger is the export share in GDP for the export, and it's, and it's worse, uh, it's worse for the, for the importers, the larger is the import share in GDP. Yeah. So that's, so those are our two instruments in hand, and quantitatively what we find on average is that a 10% increase in GDP per capita, that's, uh, and, and importantly, I, I mean conceptually, how does one think about this increase in average income? Well, it's, it's, it's exogenously given. Yeah? So it, has, it's, it doesn't have to do anything with technological progress. Yeah? It's, 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 it's an income. It's an exogenous source of income. Yeah? Uh, so a 10% increase in GDP per capita reduces the Gini coefficient by around one percentage point. Yeah? That's, that's what we find on average. And we show that uh, when there's this exogenous increase in average income, measures of education go up. Yeah, so the share of population with secondary education increases and average years of schooling in the population increases. Yeah. Uh, and when we, we, what we then show is that controlling for these measures of education reduces the coefficient on GDP per capita, yeah, which suggests that education is a channel through which average income affects the distribution. Yeah. So that's, that's the first paper, and uh, so there was some question asked uh, about 
specification. So what we have is we have a panel of countries, so country I and uh, this is five-year panels yeah, in period T, and then we have country fixed effects there and year fixed effects, so uh, it's variation uh, within countries that we use. And, uh, so we have a first stage equation where we have trade weighted world income and the interaction between the international oil price and net export shares of oil and GDP. Okay? And our uh, source of inequality data, we, I mean, we also have others as a robustness check, but the main one is the world income inequality database supplemented by PofCalNet database. Uh, we also use this robustness checks data from the world development indicators and from SOLT's uh, standardized income inequality database. Yeah? Are they major differences? No, no, they're not. No, they're not. I mean, SOLT, the, the, what I like about SOLT's data is that uh, it, it provides a so called market genie bef before transfers and tax and a net genie after transfers and tax. Yeah? But as we will see, it's not going to uh, so, uh, affect much so the results. Include, uh, both developing countries and developed nations, uh, the inequality uh, reported, for example, for India is based on consumption expenditure. Uh, well, not, 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 not the Gini data from, from SALT's uh, database that we're going to use. It's income-based. Okay. Income so based. that wouldn't include India, would it? No, no, it does include India. It does? It does okay. include India. SALT's so uh, standardized income inequality database. Standardized, huh? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to show you that if one plots here, this is just cross-section, there's nothing causal here, but uh, if one plots for the year 2000, the GDP per capita, uh, uh, and on the x-axis, the Gini coefficient, uh, one sees here a negative relationship. Yeah. So, um, richer countries, on average, tend to be less unequal with regard to income inequality. Uh, that's just what one sees in the cross-section. One can also look at the income quintiles. So, this is the bottom income quintile, yeah? So, the poor is 20%. The income share that uh, the bottom 20% has, and one sees here in the cross-section that there is a positive relationship. Uh, if one then flips it around and looks at the richest 20%, there's a negative relationship. Yeah? And uh, what's notorious is that inequality is particularly high in Latin American countries, um, here in the Norwegian countries, in the Scandinavian countries, it's with higher incomes, it's, it's low. So let me, let me show you some, some tables with some numbers. Uh, so here in panel A is two-stage least squares estimation, where we use the trade-weighted world income and the oil price variable, yeah, so the international oil price times the net export shares of oil and GDP as instruments. Uh, this is the second stage coefficient that we get, so the dependent variable is the Gini coefficient. What does that number here mean, the minus 8.5? Well, it suggests that a 10%, so 0.1 uh, increase in the log of GDP per capita uh, reduces the Gini coefficient almost by one percentage points. Yeah. Uh, now, with regard to instrument strength, we get here a first stage F statistic uh, in axis of 10, so uh, we can reject the hypothesis that there is an IV size distortion larger than 10% at the 5% significance level. Uh, the Hansen test here for over-identification uh, fails to show any evidence that the instruments are correlated with the second stage uh, residual. Uh, if we look at the income quintiles, uh, we see that there is a significant positive effect here, uh, significantly so uh, for the second, third, and fourth quintile, and a significant negative effect on the fifth quintile. Now, if we would have just done least squares estimation, that's panel B, uh, we would have also found a negative coefficient on uh, GDP per capita when the dependent variable is the Gini. Yeah. Uh, quantitatively, if you take it an absolute value, the coefficient here is about one quarter yeah, of the coefficient here in panel A. Uh, 
uh, what could be one explanation, or one explanation could be that on average over the past four decades, uh, when inequality went up, uh, GDP per capita went up as well. And I'm going to, I'm going to explore that more uh, in the second paper. Uh, there, are some, there are some papers out there by Christine Forbes, for example, in the AER, which documented that uh, inequality may have a positive effect on GDP per capita. Uh, that, that positive reverse causality bias, on average, could explain why here the least squares estimate is uh, less negative. Yeah, than the coefficient here. All right. Now we've done many robustness checks. We excluded uh, large oil importing countries and exporting countries. Uh, that's this table here. Uh, if anything, yeah, the coefficients become larger, larger in absolute size, and uh, more significant. And with regard to instrument strength and the exclusion restriction. Uh, it's, it, it suggests that the instruments are, are relevant and valid. Uh, one issue that, or one question that sometimes comes up, what about the oil curves? Uh, sometimes that uh, in research-rich economies there is massive inequality. Uh, well, we're not, we're not using uh, the quantity here, the time varying, so the quantity is kept taken as an average. What varies over time is just the international oil price. So it's really in terms of trade shock instrument that we're using. We're not using resource discoveries. Yeah. Uh, but a way to examine whether here the oil price variable has direct effects on income inequality beyond GDP per capita is just to directly include it in the second stage. Yeah. Uh, and so the excluded instrument here is the trade weighted world income. Uh, that's the excluded instrument for GDP per capita. And the included instrument in the second stage is here the oil price variable. And what we find here is that conditional on GDP per capita, there are no systematic effects. Yeah? So the terms of trade shock instrument uh, doesn't have any systematic effects on income inequality beyond average income. That's what this table shows. So this, uh, this is yeah. this sure. flipping between the fourth and the fifth point, right? Fourth, fourth and fifth quinta, yeah. So this is basically the upper middle class, and this is the, the rich, which in some countries, I think in India, what is it like? 40% of the income is held by the 50th percentile, but in some countries it's like 50%, 55%. So it's the upper middle class who are uh, uh, not going up, but the... But, there's, but the, the, top, the top quintiles, Rel relative, no, this is relative. Huh? Relative go down. Relatively, they go down. They go down. That's well, so, so the idea would be consistent, I mean, to keep it in the framework that I discussed before, is that average incomes rise and the middle class can invest, can invest, yeah? They accumulate human capital and so their income goes up. The rich were able to invest anyway Okay, so the rich, the super rich, or the relatively rich, the fifth quintile uh, income uh, <coughs> relative to the income of the rest, so the fourth quintile's income goes up, that, that thing goes down, that the ratio, the ratio goes down. So there, I mean, to push a bit further, there are no positive spillover effects here of human capital investment. Okay, that, that has to be an additional assumption. So it's not the case that suddenly the fourth quintile can invest, gets human capital, yeah? Uh, and uh, that has some kind of positive benefits for the super rich. So, I mean, what is the thing that the rich hold most of the assets in the economy, they hold most of the financial assets and real assets? They yeah. will be the ones to benefit the most from I, I, the I, growth, right? I, I understand. So, the question is with regard to the distribution between capital and labor. Mm. Uh, this is income and inequality. We don't have wealth and inequality data, right? So, valuation effects. So asset prices going up, or land prices going up. So they will get less rents from land than from dividends from assets. Yeah. Right. So there, so I mean, a lot of the inequality because some mm -hmm. of the papers that have looked at this breakup between quintiles have found that the rich, richest class actually tend to benefit the most. Yeah. And the middle classes uh, right. are actually benefiting less. Yeah. And the poorest, sort of poorest, the income of the poorest goes up. 
was mentioned for the other guns. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not what we find. What we find here is these numbers we got to the top. top the it is actually through innovation channels when this is perfectly consistent. Yeah. Because when this is relative inequality. This is what? Relative inequality. Relative Yes. So what we've done is that the super rich people who inside most of their incomes are physical assets. Mm -hmm. So they are not directly getting any higher productivity on it, which is the fourth quarter or third quarter when they should be getting that. Because it's human capital. Because it's human capital. Yeah. So I think that's one of the points that we get in that they are actually gaining more because of accumulated growth across generations rather than one generation learning mm -hmm. and increasing productivity and getting it. So, which is something that I guess is part of this where we get to the capital channel. Yeah, yeah, sure. So inequality is going up. So, but but the answer would be for for reasons other than variation in GDP per capita that are uh, exogenous. It may have to do with uh, technological change. Yeah. So skill bias, technological progress. That's one popular explanation. In, in general, the status of is going up. Sorry. Yeah. 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 It's going up. Yeah. It's going up. It's going up. It's going on. Uh, so again, this uh, skill based technological progress is, is a source of variation in income. That's not what we're capturing with our instruments. Yeah. So one other small question. Uh, yeah? I mean, this is, the theory is about human capital channel, right? So in the empirical uh, specification, we actually specify the human capital channel? It will come. Okay. It will come. This, this will come. So let me, let me just say that we can have like a dynamic specification where we control for the lag dependent variable and do some kind of system GMM estimation, right? So where we instrument the lag dependent variable by lags, first differences of lags. Uh, and we instrument GDP per capita by the trade weighted world income and the oil price variable and, you know, I mean, results go through. Uh, what happens if we use longer periods? Yeah, so if we estimate the effects over 10 years, 15 years or 20 years, I mean, if you look at the absolute magnitude of coefficients, they, they become larger. Yeah? So the effects, they accumulate over time. Uh, pre versus post-1990 period, so what we do is we interact GDP per capita with an indicator that's unity for post-1990, and we don't find any significant effects except for the fourth quintile. But even for the fourth quintile, for the post-1990 period, if we add up the coefficients, it's still the case that for the post-1990 period, uh, when average income rises, the income share of the fourth quintile goes up yeah, by around, uh, here the coefficient would be around 2.2. Uh, exporting countries versus importing countries is a difference in the effect. Uh, again, we have here an interaction model where we, inter where we multiply GDP per capita by a dummy variable that's unity for oil net exporting countries. Uh, we don't find here any significant uh, coefficients. Now, before I get to the question of human capital accumulation, which will be the next slide, I wanted to say something about how the effect of GDP per capita on you know, the Gini coefficient may vary across countries as, an, you know, as a function of economic development in these countries itself. So we have here various measures of uh, economic development. Um, average GDP per capita, so whether on average they're rich or poor, uh, your indicators for low income countries, so that's about 1,000 PPP dollars uh, using the World Bank classification, high income country, uh, the rural population share, the share of employment in agriculture, so these are all interaction models, and we don't find here any significant uh, coefficients. The only indication that there may be a little bit of uh, heterogeneity across countries is when we interact GDP per capita with an indicator variable that's unity for above median inequality countries. Yeah? So in those countries where inequality is high. Yeah? So uh, for those countries where inequality is high, so above median, 
the effect uh, is somewhat attenuated, yeah, so minus 11.8 plus uh, 2.08, so that would be around 9 point, minus 9 point something. So we can still reject the hypothesis that in the countries with above median inequality, the effect is zero, yeah, and quantitatively it's still quite large, but it's a little bit smaller. Yeah? So if inequality is very, very high, uh, the effect of average income on the Gini, uh, at least in percent terms, yeah, is uh, somewhat smaller, but it's still significant. It's still significant. Okay. Now, education as a channel. Okay. So, if we have GDP per capita yeah, in the IV regressions, yeah, instrumented by trade weighted world income and the uh, international oil price times net export shares of oil and GDP, and we include measures here of education, so average years of schooling or the share of population with secondary education. Then we see that the coefficient on measures of education is negative and significant. Yeah? So more education, more, a, a broader distribution of uh, education in the population is negatively associated with income inequality. Now, the panel B shows the unconditional effect yeah? when we do not control for education. And if you take here the absolute value yeah, of the coefficients, you see that uh, the coefficient here is larger when we do not control for education. Yeah? So a 6 relative to an 8, so about, yeah, we, one could probably say that about one-third of the effect, yeah, according to these estimates here, goes through these measures of education. Yeah? So about one-third of the effect uh, that GDP per capita has on inequality, according to these estimates here, can be explained by those measures of education. Yeah, it becomes smaller. Ab absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that's what we expect. Ideally, we would have liked it to be zero. Ideally. Yeah? We would have liked it to be zero. Because we have an exogenous source of variation in average income, so there's no issue here uh, of uh, omitted variables, right? Because we're we are inducing exogenous variation in income. What we do is we hold education fixed, right? So when average income varies as a function of the instruments, yeah, it... Uh, in this regression frame model here, it must affect the dependent variable for reasons other than education. Now, strictly speaking, okay, there's a little bit of an issue here because we, uh, we would also need an instrument for education, right, strictly speaking. And there may be measurement error in education, uh, which attenuates the coefficient on education further towards zero, right? So uh, we would expect that if we have a proper instrument for education, the coefficient in education would be even smaller. Because we expect the coefficient for years of education to be, to be more negative. Yeah? So as uh, one issue could be measurement error, but also that inequality uh, affects, uh, affects education. Yes, but, differ, diff, but differentially, but differentially, yeah. yeah? So inequality, as particular when average income is low, more inequality is good for human capital accumulation. And so the reverse causality bias here on average is positive. It's positive. Yeah? It's positive. And according to the Galo and Zero model, for at least for relatively poor economies. Okay? So now this table just shows that when average income rises, uh, exogenous variation, average income that, that has a positive effect on, on measures of education. Yeah? Okay, so that just concludes where we show that when GDP per capita goes up within countries, that income inequality tends to go down, uh, and education is a significant channel, is an important channel through which within country changes in national income affect inequality. Yeah, so that's what we take away from the first paper. And the second paper uh, is going to build on that first paper. Yeah? So now we're going to uh, take the residual from the first paper to instrument here uh, inequality in, the, in equation two. All right? And that's together with Daniel, uh, who's uh, so now at the... Uh, was you it take the, the uh, residual from the instrumented variable, not 
Yes, yes, of course, not, not from the least squares, yes, no, 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 not from, you, you, need, to, you need an IV here, which I didn't write down in this equation there to keep it simple, the notation. You need an, so you need to have instruments, exogenous instruments, Z in this equation here, to get an IV estimate of alpha in that equation here. Yeah, and then with that in hand, you can take the residual to instrument this equation here. So you need to have at least one, one, one exogenous uh, instrument to, to identify the system of equations. But with that instrument, yeah, you can get both coefficients. Oh, what, I'm, what I want to say is that with that kind of strategy, yeah, you can, under the assumption of zero covariance of the, of the residuals, you can identify both equations. That's the neat thing. With the, with the same instrument? Well, 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 so you only need one instrument and an assumption, which, is, which you always have to make in IV estimation, that the instrument is valid, okay, to identify both coefficients. Or you need one instrument in a, in a simultaneous system of equations. Yeah, so this is, well, one has to be worried here about the U, right? So what, what drives inequality beyond average income? Well, social policies, social policies, right? And uh, these kind of social policies, they have to be somehow financed, and uh, this affects incentives, so uh, that may distort uh, marginal products of laborers across sectors, uh, or the marginal product of labor relative to the marginal product of capital, right? So uh, all these kind of so policies, uh, they could be here in the, in the error terms. Yeah. In the paper, do you provide any theoretical justification or you just no. state that? No, no, this is, a, it's okay. atheoretical. I mean, to be fair in the literature, uh, in the literature that estimates the effect of inequality on growth, they don't control. They don't control for these kind of social policy. They do not. Do not. No, because this we want to. This is estimated on a large sample of countries over three or four decades. So uh, they may, they include sometimes the relative price of capital as a measure of distortions. Uh, population growth is included. Uh, uh, yeah, but. No, 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 because that's a channel in our framework, right? That's, that's, that's a channel. We don't, we don't want to include that. We do not want to include that, yeah? Okay? We do not want to include that. Precisely because we want to focus on the first uh, th theory, the first group of theories of, you know, financial market imperfection, where the investment channel is really key, right? We're not saying that that explains everything, right? We're just, we're just uh, motivated by one particular theory, right? Okay. So let me now go to the second equation, again, with panel model setup. And we have, to, we have to follow a little bit what the literature is doing. So the literature initially, uh, I'm talking about another panel literature that started with Christine Forbes' paper in the year 2000 in the AR. Uh, estimated average effects, yeah? Average effects of inequality on GDP per capita and transitional growth, okay? That's, that, that's what I mean, right? So one has GDP per capita in period T and one may control for lag GDP per capita, right? So uh, econometrically here, our contribution is to use this residual variation and inequality that's not to do GDP per capita as an instrument, yeah? So Christine Forbes' paper and the follow-up papers uh, use lags of inequality as instruments. And it has been shown, uh, one of your former colleagues by Art Cray, that these are very weak instruments. Yeah? So uh, here the residual variation on inequality that we obtained from the first paper, that's not a weak instrument at all. Yeah? So with regard to instrument strength, uh, we're, we're fine. But really the key issue here uh, with this kind of approach are yeah, whether they're omitted variables. Okay, but uh, what we show in the paper is that if we control for the variables that commonly control for in this literature, uh, things do not change. Yeah? Which doesn't mean that uh, you know social policies or some kind of other policies are, 
uh, cannot conceivably create an omitted variables problem. Uh, we just show within the literature one of the value added of this paper is a strong instrument. Now, let's see what quantitatively what we would get if we use the econometric model specification employed by the literature that just focuses on an average effect. Well, we get a significant positive coefficient. And how large uh, economically is this number? Well, the 1.2 here, and here's for the market genie and for the net genie, the 1.2 here means that over a five-year period, uh, when inequality goes up, GDP per capita goes up by around 1%. That's what the 1 means. Yeah? Now, uh, we have here an AR1 coefficient of around 0 0.8, so in the long run, in the long run, the effect is around 5%. Yeah? So one percentage point increase in the Gini in the long run increases uh, GDP per capita by around 5 or 6%. Yeah? So it's, uh, you have to invert here the characteristic polynomial. Uh, so it's about 5. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's actually very close to the estimate that Christine Forbes got in her AER paper. Uh, um, but that's not the kind of story that we want to tell. Yeah? We want to tell a different story. Uh, so we did some robustness checks for different specifications. We still got a positive average coefficient. Uh, we did a static panel. We still got a positive coefficient on inequality. But we want to tell a different story. Yeah? So we want to tell a story where the effect of inequality on transitional growth yeah, transitional because we control here for the lag dependent variable depends on initial income. All right? So we want to tell a story, or we want to see, we right? want to examine how the effect of inequality on GDP per capita depends on lag GDP per capita. Yeah? So this is T minus 1 okay, for those who can't see it. And we've also done it when we interacted with GDP per capita in 1970, so at the beginning of the panel sample. Yeah? And what we see here is that the coefficient on the interaction between inequality and lag GDP per capita is negative. It's negative. It's negative. Yeah? While well, the coefficient here on the linear term on inequality is positive, and significantly so. Yeah? Now, to interpret here this, to interpret here these estimates, what I've plotted here on the x-axis is initial income, which is the log of GDP per capita in t minus one for countries in the sample. And on the x-axis, okay, on the x-axis is theta one hat, yeah, so the coefficient on inequality, and theta two hat. Yeah, which is times ln GDP per capita and t minus 1. So basically, this here is the econometric model here. Yeah? And I'm differentiating this equation with respect to inequality. Yeah? So I get theta 1 plus theta 2 times GDP per capita and t minus 1. All right? So that's, that's on the x-axis. That's basically the marginal effect. Yeah? So how the effect of inequality on GDP per capita varies as a function of initial income. That's what I'm plotting. And so here's, here's the zero. Here's zero. Here. This is zero. Okay? This is in log. So what's the log of GDP per capita of eight? That's about $3,000. $3,000, yeah? So <laughs> below that, below $3,000, the effect is positive. So below $3,000, so let's take here a log, let's say, of 5, yeah, of 5, which is very close to the low-income country threshold. We find that yeah, the marginal effect is around 2. So a 1 percentage point increase in the Gini coefficient increases GDP per capita over a five-year period for an initial income of 5 logs, yeah, so for almost the low-income countries. Um, by around 2%. The long run effect would be larger, would be around 10%. Yeah? Now, here for the rich countries, so let's say a log of, a log of 10, yeah, uh, 
the opposite would be the case. Yeah? So one percentage point increase in the Gini would increase, sorry, would decrease GDP per capita by around 2% over a five-year period. And over the long run, it's up, it goes uh, up to about 10% uh, decrease. Yeah? And uh, so if we take the median country, the median country uh, in the world at year 2015, PPP GDP per capita, we find that hmm, for the median country in the world, yeah, it's about $10,000. Uh, what comes out from that figure is that the effect is negative. Yeah? So given current levels of development in the world, by levels of development, I mean just basically average income. Yeah? For the median country, inequality is a bad thing for growth. But for low-income countries, yeah, around the $1,000 PPP GDP per capita, that's it, PPP terms. Yeah? Uh, the effects are positive. So inequality for the low-income countries is, is a good thing. But for the median country in the world and for the rich economies, it's a bad thing. Yeah? India's GDP per capita, I think, is around six to $7,000 PPP, PPP terms. Yeah? So uh, it's just above the threshold, uh, yeah? meaning it's, according to these estimates, it's, it's slightly negative, but it would be quite small the effect. Yeah? Basically, what this is saying that as average incomes in India rise, one should be more and more concerned uh, of, 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 for, of, with regard to the effect that inequality has on, on, has on economic growth. Yeah? So rise in inequality as the country develops uh, will slow its growth rate. Transitional growth, that is. Yeah? That's, that, that's what these uh, estimates suggest. Yeah. Let me say this slightly differently. Two decades ago, the PPP GDP per capita of India was around, what was it, $2,000, uh, $1,000, two decades ago. Yeah? Um, inequality, income inequality was a good thing for growth. Yeah? But, but now, uh, at this stage of development, it's starting to become a drag on growth. That's, that's what these estimates say. So, is good for growth at low per capita incomes? Yeah. But bad for growth at higher? Yeah. Human capital, for instance, yeah. is private. But, you know, you can also have a public program which can yes. be better for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's true. So if government mm -hmm. finances all of the education, yeah. not just the tuition fees, but also the food that people have to eat, yeah. Yeah, then, you know, this, this whole thing disappears. Yeah. But that's not the case. Not for everybody, at least. The government can't do that. Okay. So the second kind of comment that the initial mechanisms that you described, they are consistent with this empirical evidence. That does not imply that that is the only possible explanation. Of course not. Of course not. So no, of course not. Yeah. But, uh, so the political economy, uh, I mean, basically the ones where it says that inequality in a democracy, uh, I mean, if the median voter is poorer, then it will vote more for, for more taxation, and taxation may be distortionary, and that, that, should, that should be a drag on growth. It suggests that inequality has a negative effect on growth. The conflict story is similar, right? So when people uh, fight, they don't produce, right? Time is allocated away from production into appropriation, okay? And therefore, income goes down. It again suggests a negative effect of, of inequality on transitional growth. Hmm? So, what, so, so what I'm saying is that the positive effect of inequality on growth uh, is consistent with theory of financial market imperfections. Hmm? This thing, okay, sir, yes. Yes. the idea of the banking system being there in the first place, that's one of the assumptions. Well, in the, well, in the limiting cases, if there's no banks, then it's it's even more severe of a problem. Then they have to finance the, all of the investment themselves. If there are no banks, then uh, the effect is even stronger. Now, because what a bank does, it it, it can co-finance, right? It provides part of part of the investment cost. Yeah. So take the twenty dollar example, right? Let's say. Uh, there's a bank, okay, it can provide half of the loan, say. There's no bank, then they need to have the $20. Yeah? 
Yeah, so, in, so in that sense, uh, inequality has even a stronger effect on investment in, 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 uh, in, in the absence of a, of a banking sector in the limiting case. Because the absence of a banking sector is just a limiting case of, of, of severe uh, financial market imperfections. And suppose if I were to take a slightly longer term view and look at Latin America, yeah. so it's a classic case of almost a different term crap. So Argentina is one of the richest countries at the end of the late 19th century. It used to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And very unequal. So you predict fast economic growth, but in your so then you have to think of another reason like conflict. Well, so what, do, do you know the GDP per capita of Argentina uh, at that time? Do you know how high it was? Was it close to the U.S.? It was close to the U.S., right? It's supposed to be the seventh richest in the world at yeah. that point. Yeah, but how high was it? I mean, in PPP but terms, in constant price. Yeah, I mean, I was, it <clears throat> was it above $3,000? Probably, huh? in constant the price terms. Is. If it's above $3,000, then it says it's a drag on growth. So you have to check, so, so, so one has to carefully check Pretty sure almost all countries would be less than $5,000 back then. Yeah, that the U.S. had about, a, I mean, at the end of the 19th century, had about $5,000, uh, the U.S., around that. So Argentina was one of the richest, uh, so the question is, is, is how much, yeah, how much it was. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it probably wasn't around, wasn't, wasn't close to this range here. It probably wasn't $1,000 or anything like that. The threshold might have changed also over time. The threshold of possibly, yeah, possibly. I mean, these estimates are for the four, past four decades. Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, of course, also, also one thing is that education, uh, the return to education, my sense, because it's complementary to technological progress, right? One needs education as, as technology advances. Is uh, my sense is that it has become particularly important in this century. That's, that's my sense. Yeah. So one has to be very careful. One has to, uh, one thing is here that the time period analyzed, which is basically the past four decades. Uh, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is if one thinks about Argentina is uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, how high was the GDP per capita? Yeah? So if one takes, wants to you know, go back in time and then Take the case of Argentina, one has to know how high was GDP per capita in Argentina. I don't know it off my head. I know for the U.S. it was around $5,000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, how, how much I got, like, I, I can basically wrap up. I mean, this is the main result. Uh, then I have now a third paper uh, that looks at the income share of the third quintal and that how, how that affects uh, GDP per capita growth, transitional GDP per capita growth that is, and I'll just, I'll just show you the figure uh, that summarizes it. Uh, here it is. So if one takes the income share of the third quintile, there's again the same econometric exercise, yeah, one finds this kind of relationship. So at a log of GDP per capita of around eight, a rise of the middle class with regard to its income share has a positive effect on growth, on transitional growth, but for poor countries, the opposite is the case. So the idea would be that how does, how does the income share of the third quintile increase in the, in the poor countries? Well, the very poor, they're too poor anyway. One can't take income away from them, right? So one, for that income share of the third quintile to increase in poor countries, it, it's very likely to come from, from the top, yeah? So the top are the ones that were able to invest in the poor country. Uh, now income is taken away from them, they're less, less, less able to invest. The, the ones in the middle, they're not sufficiently rich to pay for the fixed costs, so overall investment goes down yeah, in the poor country. But in the rich country, uh, if one takes income from uh, the, top quinta, the top quintile, gives it to the middle, uh, the top quintile, they're, they're still sufficiently rich to pay for the fixed costs, and now the middle, the middle quintile, they can now pay the fixed costs as well. Uh, that's why in, in rich countries here, there's a positive effect of an increase in the income share of the middle class, but in poor countries, there's a negative effect. And then one can apply this to ASEAN economies, and one would see that for GDP per capita in four decades ago in 1970, you know, so at an early stage of economic development, if one so wants to call it, 
an increase in the income share of the third quintile would have had a negative effect on GDP per capita by how much? Well, this is a one percentage point increase in the income share of the third quintile. Over a 10 year period, GDP per capita goes down by around 0.1 logs. The effects accumulate over time so that after about four decades, it will be lower by around 0.2 logs. 0.2 logs, yeah. Uh, in other words, at an early stage of economic development, in the 70s that is, an increase in the income share of the third quintile would have had a negative effect on transitional growth. But for current levels of GDP per capita, so if one takes the year 2010, yeah, PPP GDP per capita, the effect is positive. Yeah? How large is the effect? Well, over 10 years, GDP per capita goes up by around 0.05 logs, so by around 5%. Uh, in the long run, it's about 0.1 logs, by around 10%, roughly. Yeah. So the story is that, uh, yeah, for current levels of economic development, so for current levels of average income, uh, inequality is a drag on growth. Uh, it's quantitatively, it's going to become more of a drag the more developed uh, these economies become, and. Uh, yeah, rise of the middle class is starting to become a good thing for growth through the investment channel. That's it. That's, that, that's the main result. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Marcus. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We can take some questions. Just one follow-up question. So, so human capital and Let me put it this way. Ideally, we would like to use wealth inequality. Ideally. Okay, so yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. But what you're saying is that there's, there's a little data to use. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, for the data that are around, there's a positive correlation between wealth and income inequality. Yeah, that's that's so but. Yeah, eventually, it's like the Kuznets curve? Yes, yes, um, exactly. And the Kuznets curve arises because of a non-linear effect of inequality on growth. So we do get an inverted U-shaped relationship between inequality and GDP per capita. But the inverted U arises because of uh, a difference in the effect that inequality has on transitional growth. Yeah? So when average income is low, and the rise in inequality increases GDP per capita. But as, as initial GDP per capita crosses the threshold, then uh, an increase in inequality decreases GDP per capita. Right, so inequality here, uh, right, so if one plots. So it goes to slow, it no, 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 so in, well, it, does, it doesn't matter. So inequality and GDP, whoops, per capita, one gets this. Yeah, or one can, one can flip it and put uh, GDP per capita here and inequality here, yeah. Inequality and GDP per capita here, right? So, uh, when, yeah, so so at this stage of GDP, yeah, okay, yeah, with 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 the flipped axis, yeah, yeah. So so initially I did it right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, when. So, so at this stage, when inequality rises, uh, yeah, I think I kind of messed this up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> with flipped axis, yeah. So, so GDP per capita has to be here. Uh, that's right, with flipped axis, yeah. So initially, the way I had it, yeah, so GDP PC, and then inequality, inequality here, right? So uh, initially, when the country is poor, an increase in inequality raises GDP per capita. Yeah? So if one starts out here at T0, okay, and is here, yeah, at this kind of inequality level, then a rise in inequality will uh, shift its GDP per capita up, let's say, to T2, whatever, in infinity. Yeah, so one is here. But if one is at this point of development of GDP per capita, yeah, 
uh, kind of a rise in inequality will, will make the country go down here. Yeah? I mean, but uh, I mean, I think from your regressions, what it seems to show is that growth will slow down, not the absolute per capita GDP, right? Or well, transitional growth, that is. Transitional growth. Transitional growth. I mean, you can kind of see this here, right, by, by these graphs. I mean, these are, these are dynamic effects. Uh, after about 5,100 years, they, they really level off, okay? So there's a, there's a long-run effect on the level of GDP per capita, and there's an effect on transitional growth. Okay? Any other questions? So we'll wrap up now. Um, so thank you to Marcus for an excellent presentation. And, uh, thank you. And thank you, thank you for coming. For and for all your questions. Yeah. Thank you.